Good morning and welcome to Cedardale again. We are so pleased you've come to join us for worship. We have a lovely sermon today for you and you will just spend your day thinking about the content of it. But before we begin, I will read you our scripture for today, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. You will know this, it's a very familiar scripture to all of you. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. That's our scripture reading for today, and now we welcome Pastor Grant. Good morning. It's good to be with everybody today, and I wish you a wonderful day today and a great week ahead. This is a wonderful time in August where the corn is coming out and all those good things are happening as we see the fall coming up. But uh, I wanted to take the time to welcome you all from Georgina, Perfola, or wherever you are in Ontario, Canada, or the world. God bless you, and thank you for making the effort to join us today. I'll be uh, speaking on the title, A Time to Love, and it'll be taken from one verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 8. But here are some other verses to climb in with that wonderful thought. Exodus 15, 11 says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Ephesians 3.19 will say, To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Isn't that wonderful? And Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. I, it shall not cling to me. And in our text today, it says there, there is a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We just give you praise, Lord, for all you're doing throughout not only this church, but in so many ways throughout this world. You are doing wonders that we've just spoken about. Father, thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. We pray that our hearts would be stirred. We pray that our souls would be moved. And we pray that our minds would be set on fire like those that were walking on the Emmaus Road with you the day after the, uh, the crucifixion. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would guide us and move us and shape our hearts. Instill in us a wonderful passion for you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. It's an amazing text, but 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8 also is as well. Love never fails, and that is a wonderful truth that we're going to hear about today in the love of Christ for us. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace, Ecclesiastes 3, 8. The life of Charles Darwin is an interesting one. As a young man, he had a great love for art, music, and literature. But as he pursued his career, he lost his sense of, of balance in life. He became obsessed with his scientific thinking, and it led him astray. He rejected the idea 
that, was, that there was a time for every matter under heaven. For him, there was only time for his specialty in the world of science. Variety vanished from his life, and with it, the ability to appreciate the many wonderful gifts God gives to add pleasure to our life. In his declining years, when he had the time to enjoy the beauty of life, he discovered it was too late. And he writes, To my unspeakable sorrow, I cannot endure to read a line of poetry. I have tired lately to enjoy Shakespeare, but I found it so intolerably dull that it nauseated me. I have even lost my taste for pictures and music. And he goes on, I retain some fondness for beautiful scenery, but it does not cause me the exquisite delight which it formerly did. My mind seems to have become a mere machine for grinding general laws out of large collection of facts. You see, he had no time to love God, and all became futile and vanity and a chasing after the wind. In this verse of Ecclesiastes 3.8, we are looking at today, there are two couplets there, although from verses 1 to 8, there are 14 in total. A time to love and a time to hate is followed by the second couplet, a time of war and a time of peace. Written around 935 BC, Ecclesiastes is in the Bible to expose the insignificance and uselessness of life lived apart from the Creator. Known as wisdom literature from the time it was written, it declares without apology the vanity and futility of life and chasing after the wind that occurs so often in this life. Some have thought that the preacher's negativism proclaims indirectly the reality of God in the struggle of life here on earth in the life of faith. This is quite unique for this wisdom literature lifts the heart to heavenly things by showing the futility of this world, said Nicholas de Lira in the 1200s. Isn't that amazing? 28 times the word time is repeated as Solomon presses home the point of God's foreordination and man's accountability. C. Bridges says, we are permitted to taste the bitter wormwood of earthly streams in order that standing by the heavenly fountain, we may point our fellow sinners to the world of vanity we have left to the passing glory and delights of the world that we have newly found. Here in this wonderful book, we discover that man has a capacity to, to know how all things fit together, the end from the beginning, and yet he cannot know them fully until he comes to know the glorious one who has made man in his image with the capacity to understand his purpose in life. Here then is the full rendition of Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8 from the message by Eugene Peterson. There's an opportune time to do things, a right time for everything on the earth, a right time for birth and another for death, a right time to plant and another to reap, a right time to kill and another to heal, a right time to destroy and another to construct, a right time to cry and another to laugh, a right time to lament and another to cheer, a right time to make love and another to abstain, a right time to embrace and another to part, a right time to search and another to count your losses, a right time to hold on and another to let go, a right time to rip out and another to mend, a right time to shut up and another to speak up, <laughs> a right time to love and another to hate, a right time to wage war and another to make peace. Ecclesiastes 3.11 though will say, God set eternity in the hearts of men. Every human soul has a God-given awareness that there's something more in this life. Yet we're told no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end in verse 11 of chapter 3. In other words, in his fallen state, man senses there ought to be something more than this world, but can't discern it. The good news is that our God is God who has revealed himself to us. And through that revelation, with the ultimate revelation, being his coming to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, we can understand some things regarding eternity. Namely, that God has provided that means whereby you and I 
can have a personal relationship with him that we can enjoy now throughout all eternity, this wonderful relationship. God has provided the means whereby we might be rescued and redeemed. This means you and I can have a personal relationship with God. Of course, this is through accepting his wonderful provision for the forgiveness of sins and the salvation provided by Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Life is short, eternity is long. It is only reasonable that this short life be lived in light of eternity, said Charles Spurgeon. There is a time for everything to happen and a time to do everything. When the Holy Spirit told Philip to go to the Ethiopian eunuch's chariot, it was the perfect time. The prodigal son got his inheritance at the wrong time. It was a blessing he was not prepared to handle wisely. The result was it became a curse and cost him everything. In the story of Esther, where Mordecai said, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Queen Esther recognized the importance of timing and she acted and used her wonderful position to save the entire Jewish race. Solomon, in his search for meaning and fulfillment, gets to the end of the, bo of the book and writes, now all has been heard, here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. I have a simple outline this morning, just two points. First, our Lord's love and longing for us. And second, our love and longing for Christ. We enter today into the school of Christ. An academy of learning awaits us as we explore the Savior's love for us. For with him, it was a time to love us. Our text says, a time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. There's one line from this passage that may cause us some concern. <laughs> a time to love and a time to hate? If we're supposed to love our enemies, then when is it the time to hate? We will look at this shortly. Here I must lay the groundwork as we journey with this verse. I have mused over the meaning of the first couplet and need to remind us all of what it, what it means, what we are to love. We are encouraged not, okay, not to love the world, or its system, Romans 12, 1 and 2. We are encouraged not to love the pattern of this world either, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Rather, we are greatly encouraged throughout all the scripture to love and reverence the Lord our God with all our hearts. Next, a time to hate. This has a huge significance for the life of believers everywhere today. What are we to hate? It sounds strange, doesn't it? Well, I believe we are to hate evil. We are to hate sin. We should hate horrible wickedness and the works and schemes of the devil. Maybe we should hate the state of being apathetic and lukewarm towards the living God as well. A time for war. Here too I mused on this quite a bit and discovered that the Christian life is all about spiritual warfare. For we labor against principalities and powers that seek constantly to undo us. We are encouraged to put on the whole armor of God, as the Apostle will say in Ephesians chapter 6. And lastly, a time of peace. The millennium will be a time of peace like no other, with Christ reigning on this earth for a literal thousand years. Also, we have a time of peace when we accept the salvation God gives. For it soothes and restores the soul, and it's here where we can give up our warring spirit and come to him and find that shalom and peace that he truly promises. I will now focus my attention on the phrase, a time to love, in two ways. First, our Lord's love and longing for us. He had a time to love. In eternity, he had a time to love. If we could take a time machine and go back to the council chamber of the Lord Almighty, it's here in eternity, our Prince of Peace foresaw that Adam and you and I and all mankind would be ruined by the fall. Jesus, lover of our souls, perceived all of us going astray like lost, scampering sheep. Therefore arose the great need for a deliverer, traveling in the greatness of his strength, as the mighty book of Isaiah will say in Isaiah 63, 1, to rescue and redeem mankind. The Savior, the all-sufficient one, our great Redeemer, was the only all-sufficient one to accomplish this mighty task. 
So friends, it was with Jesus a time to love. And he entered into a holy covenant with the Father to save his people from their sins, as it will say in Matthew 121, so that they would be safe in his everlasting arms. We shouldn't forget or dismiss the mission Christ undertook to be our substitute and to die for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, as it will say in 1 Peter 3, 18. Now swing your thoughts to the birth of Christ. Here Jesus left everything and journeyed into the world of mankind, leaving his throne of glory was truly a time to love. Dismantling and disrobing himself of all glory and bearing the form of a servant, he came to a feeding trough, brethren, he did, a feeding trough in Bethlehem, and in Mary's arms we find him like any other infant, yet he was the wonderful counselor and mighty God, Isaiah had foretold, God with us. Becoming incarnate and living amongst men, it was necessary, like Micah would say, he would do justly with all holy righteousness and loving mercy. He would live on behalf of his people, Micah 6, 8. This could only be accomplished through the reproach that Christ bore, the suffering, the shame, the scourging, the endless blows and rebukes, and ultimately the crucifixion itself. Jesus' cries and death upon Calvary's cross was a time to love. For having loved his own, he loved them even unto the death, the Bible says in John 13, verse 1. The pain ridden Jesus, slumping on the cross, soaked in his own blood, like a sheep at the slaughter, was a time to love. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it. And if a man tried to buy love with all his wealth, he, he could utterly be scorned. Song of Solomon 8.7 his shame and suffering being offered and being offered wine mixed with myrrh, his body with the weight on his wrists, horrible and excruciating pain shooting through his entire body, Jesus ex exhaling in deep anguish and searing agony. He uses each caught breath to communicate forgiveness to all who are near, while soldiers gamble for his clothes. This was a time to love. The night in Gethsemane, when his griefs were so horrible that his soul was sorrowful and consumed unto death, as I would say in Matthew 26, 28. And his sweat was like great drops of blood dripping onto the earth. The betrayal of Judas being forsaken by all his disciples, the denial of Peter, the mockery of trials before Annas and Caiaphas, Pilate, Herod, and the scourging and the spitting, not to mention the untold stress and the anguish he endured. Beloved, we gloss over this, but no one has suffered like he has. Hours of limitless pain, cycles of twisting cramps, and deep gasps of breath for breath, crying out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How much he endured for my sake and yours. Can you hear him in the prophetic language of David in the 22nd Psalm? It says this, my life is poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like a sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth and yet you have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Psalm 22 verses 14 to 16. Surely, it was a time to love. Right now, has Christ ceased to love, brethren? No, no, he hasn't. For every day and every second is a time of love with him. When we were distant and far from him and living according to our own whims and fancies, he loved us. Living careless and carefree without him, he loved us. Perhaps you took his name in vain, ignored the Lord's day, yet it was a time to love with him, and his great love was for you, even when you and I were dead in trespasses and sins, as it says in Ephesians 2, 1. For Christ to love us when we love him is awesome on his part, but for him to love us when we hated him is mind-boggling because of his amazing grace. Even though it was a time to hate with us, it was a time of love with him. Secondly, our love and longing for Christ. Love. There are few things so universal and challenging as love. 
Love for God is the most important commandment, Jesus says, and is one that is found in both the Old and the New Testament. No matter what your friends say, living for yourselves at our own pleasures is a dead-end road that will never bring us lasting happiness. For from the heart, all the issues of life or springs of life will flow, it will say in Proverbs 4.23. And without one's will, desires, passions, affections, and thoughts rightly aligned with God, the life of love is very hard. So we are called to love God with all our heart and soul, which is intended to mean to love God with all our whole being and a heart-encompassing allegiance. Maybe you've heard people use this Latin term, seize the day, as they try to stay motivated. But when it comes to purpose and direction, we need to come to the Lord, and he will direct our steps, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Billy Graham once said, we're never useless if our lives are in God's hands. Amen. Even in the smallest, most mundane tasks, he says, can be purposeful if we do them for the right reasons. You're searching for something and haven't found it, he said. And that something is Christ. There is no love in the world like the love that God can give you. Isn't that amazing? People are searching for the meaning of life, but so often look in the wrong places. Billy Graham says the true meaning of life can only be found in Christ. Did you know that in 1929, in the Rose Bowl, a man became known by a new name that day, Wrong Way Roy Regals. Wrong Way Roy was hit so hard in the football game, he, re he recovered a fumble and he ran the wrong way with the football and scored a touchdown for the other team and lost the game. He was nominated for the Georgia Tech Hall of Fame for helping them win the 1929 Rose Bowl. Sometimes life hits us so hard we lose focus of the goal line, which is to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul. Solomon says, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever it has, has been and what will be has been before, and God will call the past into account, Ecclesiastes 3, 14 to 15. The response God wants us to have for him is one of reverence and humble submission, knowing that all times are held in the hands of him who will call the past into account, should awaken an awe of God in our human hearts. This is not the kind of awe or holy fear that comes from facing the monstrous or the unknown, but one in which we revere and stand in awe of God's glory and holiness. When we fear God by seeking his will and following his commandments, the treadmill of life is no longer a reference to vanity, but now becomes an invitation to experience the hand of God and his face shining on us. Numbers chapter 6. Brethren, we should awaken all our zeal and passion and let our Savior's voice inspire us while he speaks into our hearts. When has it been a time of love for you, for us, to go to the beginning of your journey with Christ? Do you remember the wonderful day when Jesus first met you? You can never forget that time when that great burden of your heart was rolled away and you were greatly relieved, and, and a great joy swelled your heart. Well, that was in a wonderful way, a time to love, because it should always be a time to love the Lord our God. Amen? Don't let lukewarmness steal your devotion away. Don't become distant. and Don't lose your first love. Whatever, friends, it's a time to love our Lord with even greater intensity than ever before. Have you backslidden? Yes. And has the Lord of all knocked at the door of your heart? till you have let him in again, then that has been a time for you, a time of love. Love him more than ever then. Have you prospered in this life, brethren? Have you been wonderfully blessed? Have things fallen into place that seemed impossible? Have right doors of opportunity been opened for you at just the right time? Then that was a time of love, your Lord. That was a time for you to love the Lord your God with all his blessed benefits and his grace shining on you. When you see people grow cold, and you see people falling away or becoming distant, then it's a time to love the Lord all the more with a holy passion, because the, man, the love of many is waxing cold, as Jesus would say 
in Matthew 24, verse 12. When mankind becomes more fickle and mean, lay hold more firmly on him who is our rock, because he will never disappoint those who put their trust in him. Isaiah 49, 23. When we can fellowship with each other in Christ, then it is too a time to love and thank him for the gift of friendship and fellowship in his holy name. Thinking about this phrase, a time to love, I was greatly overjoyed, reminding myself to work with all my might for my gracious Lord while I can in Georgina. No greater thing in all the earth captures me as the supremacy of God in preaching and the salvation he offers in his holy name. So as long as I am a pastor, I will continue the grand course of focusing on what magnifies our Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming his greatness in creation and history, proclaiming the great love of Jesus Christ, proclaiming the cross of Christ, proclaiming the new birth and salvation in his name, proclaiming sanctification and the transformation of our lives because of Jesus' wonderful work in us by the blessed Holy Spirit. These are just some of the unsearchable riches of Christ that I'm truly excited about. In Isaiah 43, 7, we find we are created for God's glory. In Psalm 91, 1, we see that the entire created order is designed by God to proclaim the glory of God. We see in Colossians 1, 16, that all this work of creation, all things were created through him and for him, and everything exists for his glory, brethren, his name, his honor, his fame, and his praise. Oh, what a sacred opportunity preaching is to see hearts warmed in holy affection, to see souls stirred for the glory of God, and to see hearts mended by the grace of God alone. This is my time to love. So, brethren in Christ, is it not your time to love as well? Think of the opportunities you have awaiting you today, encouraging the needy and unfortunate, helping the feeble, comforting the desponding, reclaiming the backsliding, yes, pointing people to Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, and living as a marvelous epistle of his grace. Oh, to love God more and thank him for the wonders of the Christian faith, that God loves you and I with an intense love, that there is always room at the cross for you. Let me say that again. There is always room at the cross for you, and that Jesus our Lord still saves. In conclusion, the psalmist says in Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In Psalm 42, we're encouraged to pant like the deer at the water brook for him. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, says the mighty hymn. And think of another time coming very soon, brethren, when it will be a time to love our Lord more fervently than we do here. To be with the King of Kings and enjoy him forever will be a time of love in the greatest and grandest way. Oh, the great heart of his overflowing with compassion, his dying the just for the unjust, that we that he might bring us to God. Can we look at him and not love him? Then it should be with us always a time to love. Today was yesterday's tomorrow. Today is the first day of the rest of your life, and today will be tomorrow. So trust him now, brethren. The psalmist put it this way, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 16, verse 11. Cling to the unchanging one and let his great love for us inflame your very soul. Don't be like the boy who was running to the bus just as it pulled away. A man standing there said, I guess you didn't run fast enough. Oh, yes, I did, said the boy. I just didn't start soon enough. Yes, friend, it's always the right time to trust in Christ, so start now. Would you buy a 300-year-old rare antique piece of uh, furniture and burn it in a campfire? So why on earth would we have today and waste it? Trust him with all your heart. God bless you in your journey with Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. We ask, Lord, that you would guide us and move us and shape our hearts. Give us a great hunger for you, Lord. Give us a great passion and a yearning for you. Give us a great longing in our heart of hearts to love you more, to long for you, and to pant like the deer that pants for the water brook, as, as David said in Psalm 42. Lord, we ask that you would do these wonderful things and that you would have all the glory and honor 
and all the power given to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a very wonderful week. Amen.